I feel for actors being kind of alone in this big area and then having this booth where you can't hear anybody and they do a take and they put their all into it and then they look up and, so, and five people are in the back room going. <laughs> <laughs> and then after about a minute of that they go. Can you uh, do it again? <laughs> <laughs> Only more so this time. <laughs> and it's like, what the hell does that mean? You know? Hi everybody, please join me in welcoming two of the filmmakers behind the Incredibles movies, writer-director Brad Bird and Elastigirl herself, Holly Hunter. <laughs> superhero midlife crisis movie. What was the starting point for you, and how long was it from when you kind of came up with the initial idea to actually making a movie? Well, I actually had another idea that um, had, uh, um, it was like a monster movie where the monster was kind of past his prime. And uh, <laughs> I liked the past his prime part of that idea, and I said, what if you had a superhero that was past his prime? And the minute I kind of got entertained by that idea, I started asking myself questions like, why is he past his prime? You know, is he not able to be a superhero? And I went, no, they're outlawed. And uh, is he married? Yes. Is she a superhero? Yes. <laughs> uh, do they have kids? Yes, they do. Three. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, and uh, so it just, it just went like that. I just kept asking questions and kept kind of tinkering on it. And it um, wasn't until we were in production. It was before I got a chance to make movies. I was working on The Simpsons, and, and I was doing OK financially. But, but my first love was movies. And, I, and I, part of the reason I didn't become a producer on The Simpsons when they asked me in season two was I wanted to be able to go out and still pitch movie projects. And, and if, I, if you're a producer, you work at least six days a week, sometimes often seven. I mean, it's, it, TV is really hard, as you will attest. Yes. It's hard. It's a grind. So, uh, so uh, I was trying to get movies going. And, I, and then I got married, and we started having kids. And I was starting to worry that I would never get the opportunity to make a film. And if I did get the opportunity, I would be a, a bad dad. Mm -hmm. And it was that anxious anxiety of, if I'm a good filmmaker, I'll be a bad dad. If I'm a good dad, I'll be a bad filmmaker. And I didn't realize till we were in production that all that anxiety between work and family is in the movie. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't, I was just, oh, this is cool superhero movies that has nothing to do with me. And then I realized that, you know, well, kind of, she's kind of my wife, you know, uh -huh. and the arguments that they have are arguments that my wife and I have. And, Stuff that happens in the family happened with me and my sisters and my parents and, and my sons and, and my wife. And, and it, you know, that's sort of the, how it began. And so we're in the process of coming up with the idea and writing a script and everything. Uh, do you start thinking about actors? And how did you know Holly Hunter would be so great as Elastico? Well, I was a huge fan of uh, uh, Holly's uh, since Raising Arizona. Woo! And, uh, Woo! And, uh, You know, uh, I was working on uh, The Simpsons, and of course, she had done broadcast news for James Brooks, uh, who was one of the exact producers of The Simpsons. Yeah, she kills it in broadcast news. That's kind of her setting, is like killing it or off. And, and that's one of, so she was one of my favorite actresses. She's in the piano and always and all this stuff. And uh, I just, um, I wanted someone who uh, had some vulnerability but sounded like she had a strong backbone and that she was going to last the winter, you know? <laughs> and uh, that's Holly. She just has this incredibly resilient spirit that is somehow going to win. It's like, I just feel like if the apocalypse happens, you know, there will be you know, millions of deaths, and Holly will be standing there <laughs> going, it's a shame. 
Because <laughs> she won't be going down. So there was just something about that blend of, of, of vulnerability. That doesn't sound blendy. No, no. Well, no. But you're, you have vulnerability, but you also have this tensile strength that, that uh, I wanted. So uh, I was really happy when she agreed to join our merry band. Well, and Holly, what was your initial response when you first read the script? What did you respond to, and what were your initial conversations with Brad like about the character? Well, there was something that was that was a, there was a through line throughout from the beginning of The Incredibles when I first heard about it through Brad to to now, which is, which is that my my conduit for this movie for these two movies from the beginning was Brad. And really exclusively, Brad. So when 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 you it's told the name me of my autobiography, by the way, exclusively Brad. Exclusively <laughs> Brad. <laughs> and um, Brad is my conduit. Would be my autobiography. <laughs> no, um, and that sounds wrong. But <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Next. <laughs> no, I, I was going to say before I really said bad things was that um, was that Brad told me about the movie. He didn't send me a script. I never read a script for either movie. The movies came to me by you know verbiage. Um, really, you, you had pages to work off of, though. Yeah, but really, the, the, what was transmitted to me was actually through you. It was like you would talk to me about what the scene was about. You told me about the movie. I mean, yeah, I, I might have read a, a few pages, but really it was like a verbal kind of exchange. That's where I got the ideas that, you know, you told what story it was, you know, from, from the beginning. It, that was how it was passed on. Well, and how did the two of you work together in the recording studio? Are there other actors there, or is it just you and Brad? Or no, I mean, I've always wanted to work that way. I think Wes Anderson works that way, where he gets everybody together, and they kind of block out a couple of weeks where they can uh, rehearse and then just kind of be together and try stuff. And, and I think they even uh, record um, kind of um, working around. In other words, not static, but if they're moving in the scene, they're moving uh, when they record it. And I've always been interested in that. Um, I can never really get all the people I want um, uh, to block out that much time. Everybody's busy. And they're busy because they're good. And you know, you want them to be good. And also, um, I don't, I kind of do a little bit of it and then kind of feel how it looks in storyboard form and then I tinker with it a little more and this isn't really set up as well as I'd like here. So I'm kind of um, going over the whole thing all the time. And so it has to be open to that. And um, so I've only been able to record people at the same moment a couple of times and I always enjoy it. But you also, if they, I like people to overlap. I like timing where people cut each other off and overlap. And uh, you, you are married to whatever overlap they do if you do it that way. And, and that's fine, but sometimes I'll get a better idea for another line and I'll put it in there and overlap that. And that works even better than the one I had before. And that's an editing room discovery. So you kind of get um, more malleability, but I do think that there is something to actors bouncing off each other, and, and I, I'm going to try to do that in some animated film in the future, if I can. But you know, um, it, it's also interesting and fantastic. I mean, I, I, when I, whenever I've done any kind of voiceovers, or I, I'm alone, you know, generally you're in a, a soundproof booth, with glass around you, and you see the person who's directing you from the other side of the, the glass wall, and it's kind of psychologically alienating. Yeah, you feel, off-putting. Yeah, well, it, it, and, and you can make it work for yourself, but the way that Brad did these two movies is he is literally, you know, I'm here and Brad, Brad's right there. 
So it's like he's my acting partner. It was always highly entertaining. He, he did Edna, but it's highly <laughs> But it's also highly entertaining to hear how he does everybody else. So that was always fun for me. Um, well, I, I kind of I feel for actors being kind of alone in this big area and then having this booth where you can't hear anybody and they do a take and they put their all into it and then they look up and, so, and five people are in the back room going. <laughs> <laughs> and then after about a minute of that, they go, Can you run, do it again? <laughs> <laughs> Only more so this time. <laughs> and it's like, what the hell does that mean? You know? So uh, I like to be there so that I, the actors feel like I'm in it with them. And if they have any questions or are uh, needing a little jolt of energy that would come from the other actor if they were in it, I try to provide that. Anything to help them get in that space. And, and uh, um, you know, I, I want to help them to get there as much as I can and not be in their way. Yeah, yeah. so it, it really does feel more collaborative. I mean, because Brad's in there with, he's in there with the actor. So he's kind of, sort of, you're the director, but you're also kind of, sort of, an actor, too. I mean, there's no judgment. Um, that, that was how I felt. And in addition to that, we did a lot of recording at Disney um, in this kind of hallowed recording studio where they did Jungle Book. And I mean, Louis Kramer was in there um, doing all of his amazing work. And Peggy Lee sang in there. Yeah, and the sound mixer is unbelievable, and they have bars that come down from the ceiling, and you can hang from them if you need to, or it has a bar where you can like push on it from the floor, or you can try to pull it up from the floor. I mean, it's it's got this kind of imaginative like gym in a way <laughs> where you can just go in there and have fun. Um, so I just felt that it was it was a really creative. Uh, event doing both movies. Well, and at the point when you're in there recording your performance, has any of the movie been animated yet? Uh, we have. We probably record uh, eight sessions, maybe something like that. Sometimes less, sometimes a little more in the course of a movie, and we'll record, you know, ten pages or more. Uh, at a time, sometimes it's more, and then we end up changing a scene and we need to redo it. Um, but it's kind of spread out a little bit over time because we're figuring out the movie as we're making it. Well, so I'm curious, Holly, the first time you saw The Incredibles, was it what you expected or were you surprised? What was your reaction to it? I, mean, I was shocked. I was totally shocked. I was told this was going to be a travel log. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I just don't know what I was expecting, but it was not the movie. I mean, I, I, you know, the, I, I just felt like Incredibles, it, it, it was like a template set. I mean, I, I just felt like it, it, was, it was an original sighting. It was like nothing I'd ever seen. Um, the vitality of it, the and the humor was had such sophistication, um, and at the same time, it didn't it didn't talk down to kids and it didn't talk up to it. I felt like it it was so complete. It was such a whole voice coming at the audience that you know I don't know. I just kind of I found it. I just kind of fell in love with it. Um, well, I think we've got time for some audience questions, and it looks like there's a lot, so uh, let's see. I guess uh, we'll start right there. Yeah. Uh, so a uh, part of making a great hero is building the character <coughs> and allowing that to build on the morale of the hero, which in turn gives confidence to a person at the end of the film. Uh, over the course of the two films with The Incredibles, uh, what did you learn about balancing those types of callbacks with world building, especially in the Marvel era? Uh, sum that baby up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the question was about certain like, world building and balancing world building between the elaborate character building of heroes, especially 
Questions about over the course of the two films, balancing out how you build the heroes, how you build the world, and what you can learn about the Marvel era. Well, um, I didn't know I was in the Marvel era. At the time, I just thought it was the era. <laughs> uh, I mean, when we made the first one, there were only two active superhero fan franchises. Batman had gone into, uh, you know, hiding after the nipple Batman. <laughs> and uh, Chris Nolan had yet to reinvent it. He was in the process of, I guess, working on it. But the two that were going were X-Men and Spider-Man. And um, so we had a lot of elbow room on this. And I had the idea, early versions of the idea, before uh, any of those had kind of re-kicked it in. Uh, and um, uh, world building. I think that the film is a gumbo of all the stuff I liked as a kid. And I liked adventures, and I liked superheroes, but it wasn't mainly what I liked. I actually was more into spy stuff. And you can tell because the film has more of a spy vibe. And it's because when I was a kid, um, superheroes, when they were, I didn't know them from comic books that much. People would come up to me and ask me if I knew what 37, the issue 37 of whatever man was, and I have no idea, you know. And, and they're surprised by that, but I was more of a movie guy. So the movie and television versions of superheroes were usually pretty cheap and sometimes campy. So the, the, con the convincing superhero-esque world of my childhood was spy films. Bond films are kind of superhero movies and that their villains are over the top, their music is over the top, the equipment is over the top, <laughs> and uh, you know, uh, I just loved them. And uh, so that is infused, the movie is more infused with that kind of vibe than it is straight superhero stuff. Um, so that was the world building for me. And when I talked to Michael Giacchino, that was the kind of music that I wanted, was this sort of 60s, uh, you know, Man From Uncle, uh, Mission Impossible, James Bond, um, Johnny Quest, you know, that kind of really, yeah, Johnny Quest lover right there. <laughs> yeah, you'll see some tributes to Johnny Quest in and the new one. And this is a Johnny Quest lover. Yeah, I love some Johnny Quest. Make the movie. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that's some other things I want to do. But I will gladly see it if somebody does it right. Um, but that's uh, in, in balancing the um, uh, that with the world building. I think that it's all about character, and um, that's why I wanted to start the movie with them in the, their prime, and then uh, uh, kind of show where they came from. And it was also a very deliberate choice to not begin what everybody was expecting, which was them in the middle of being superheroes. In other words, they're young and they are in their prime, but they're sitting in front of a, a, a camera with a beat up 16 millimeter print talking about what it's like being a superhero. So instead of showing them, you know, um, bashing somebody's face and, and killing bad guys, um, we show them sitting there talking about, yeah, this is good, but this part about it is kind of a drag. And if you notice, each one of them is wrong about their life. Bob says, what I really want to do is settle down. And he's the worst at settling down. <laughs> and uh, Holly's character says, settle down. What are you, crazy? Why would I do that? You know, I want to be in there with the big dogs, you know? Leave the saving the world to the men? I don't think so. And she's great at being a mom and, and settling down. And Frozone is talking about playing the field, and he is very married in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, so uh, that was just a little snippet of uh, getting people off balance initially, and then showing them that this film is going to be about their lives, not about bashing superhero uh, villains as much. A anyway, hope that answered it. Uh, yes. I'll repeat for the back. The question is, what Brad's favorite part of writing and directing in two Incredibles films was? Um, probably, if, if we're going to go for a single moment that was my favorite, it was, um, I didn't show much of it to my family. 
and my, when we were making it. I, I want to get it right before they see it. So they hadn't seen very much of it, and my um, sons were all right in the perfect, like, Johnny Quest zone. They were, uh, and so uh, I went to the, the crew screening for uh, uh, Pixar, it was on a big screen in a great old movie theater in Oakland called Paramount, and um, big sound and everything, and I, I liked sitting with my wife and sons and just looking over, and they were kind of going like this, and I'm, uh, it sounds like I'm patting myself on the back, but it, it's, it's really a result of everybody's work, you know, Holly's, Craig's, the whole team, but they were kind of going <laughs> like this, and then at the end of it, uh, when it went, uh, uh, written, directed by Brad Bird, they went. <laughs> <laughs> like, you mean that idiot that stumbles down the stairs in the morning actually did something? <laughs> so it, it, that was really nice, though, because they really liked the movie. And uh, that was the best single moment. Uh, yeah, they're in the back. Um, given that the structure and story are so tight and so well done, did you encounter any point where you had written yourself into a corner and then needed to get yourself out of it? Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if I would classify it quite that way. There were a lot of problems and a lot of things that I wrote wrong before I wrote them right. Um, you know, you write a scene because it's your best possible answer to a question that you have, and then you write it, and you record it, and you let it play, and it's usually before you guys get to it. So, so the really bad damage is usually <laughs> before you guys, we try to vet it before you guys get it. But there was a scene that I did uh, with um, uh, Mirage in the first movie explaining that she had been in love with Gazer Beam or something, and, and it seemed like incredible reason why she would let these guys go. And when I put it up there and I tried to get the best performance I could out of our scratch voice artist who did it fine, but uh, we did drawings and it just stunk out loud. And, and, I, and I cut it the best to my, of my abilities and there it is and it just is terrible. And now what are you gonna do? Because you still have to explain why she would let these people go. And then, the, 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 it, you, so you fail a lot at more elaborate explanations. There was a lot of her emoting about Gazer Beam and all this stuff, and the audience doesn't care about Gazer Beam. They haven't seen him. Who's gonna, wait, 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 you know, anyway, <laughs> stunk. And, and the answer was uh, simplicity, which was uh, when uh, she shoves, when he is about to grab her, uh, about to grab Syndrome, and she pushes him out of the way, and he ends up grabbing her, and then threatening to kill her. Uh, and and uh, Syndrome is seemingly indifferent to that. Um, the fact that he seemed to value life more than Syndrome did is what pushed her over, and to me that was, physical and you could see it, which made it a lot better than her talking about being in love with some guy that's a skeleton now, you know. So, uh, you know, I mean, we could, if you want to stay for another three hours, I can talk tell you about all the other lame scenes that I wrote. <laughs> but, uh, you know, no, you make mistakes and you hopefully kill them all off before you guys get to see them. Who's got a question for Holly? Uh, the young girl, the side girl too. Yeah, the little, little girl right here. Yeah. When you think Kyle's me coming out. <laughs> <laughs> when is Incredible Spree coming out? Oh, I don't have a watch. Ah, that's a You can count on that. <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, I don't go with this with the idea of when can I do the next one. I have other things that I'd like to do, but if I could come up with a, a good reason to engage these fine people again, I, I would certainly um, move ahead with it. So uh, I haven't made any firm plans yet, but I haven't made any firm plans not to do it either. So there you go. That's the best answer I can do, and I appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Can I ask two questions or just one question? Uh, let's go with one. Just so many people. Okay, so I have one for Holly. What was the most difficult scene to uh, act in for in 
Incredibles 2 is because you mentioned that you recorded your lines in a in like a soundproof box pretty much. So how the question is what was the most difficult scene to act in Incredibles 2? Uh it was the stretching, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ow. Um I mean, uh, you know, I would say, like physically, the 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 yelling because when we would do any scene to require yelling, it would be, you know, it's like fantasy yelling. It's like, wow, I've never yelled this loud before in my entire life, um, and I'm going to get paid to do it, and I will be un unable to speak for two days after. Um, Which may be just the kind of break you need. <laughs> but, um, that was interesting because, I mean, Brad and I talked about this, you know, earlier, is it, that, you know, when you're screaming like that, tonally, it's like, can I scream like that and still be funny? I mean, because you don't want it to be rage-filled, even though the character may be rage-filled. There, there's, it's a, it's interesting to try to strike the right tone at that pitch. Um, yeah. Um, well, I, I think that uh, she uh, had to do a lot of switching. Uh, like, there's a moment in Incredibles 2 where she's on her last cycle, and she's getting these very intense instructions. She's trying to catch up with this speeding train that's going super fast, and she's having to catch up with it through traffic. And you guys will see it after this, right? That's cool. <laughs> uh, but uh, but uh, anyway, she had to go. That's good. Um, um, but anyway, uh, she has to. Uh, take these instructions, and then she gets a phone call from her son that's wondering where his shoes are. <laughs> and to me, that's motherhood in a, in a you know, is, is she's intensely involved in something and yet still has to shift. And even though she's yelling and she's in the wind and she's on something that's moving, her tone shifts to this supportive, very, she's speaking quickly because she can't take long, but she tries to also get in instructions, try looking under your bed, and, da, 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 and then she goes, how much time? You know, because she's got to get back to what she's doing. And to be able to keep the pace up, have it be intense, and yet have a very specific tone shift is tricky, and uh, uh, I think she nailed it. Yay. Yay, Holly. Questions about the differences between the process with animation and live action, since you both have done a lot of them. Well, you know, it's, it's, that's an interesting question because I always imagined, um, never having done an animated movie before, that it would be wildly different vocally from doing a, a regular movie. But you know, like the 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 the, the voice would be more colored. You know, you, you would try for notes. You, you would try to have more um, body in your voice. Uh, but I actually, I found that that wasn't the case. You, you know, that it had, it, once again, it has to be provoked by, by thought. You know, my, my thinking and my feeling per, is, is the thing that provokes it. I think it I couldn't think technically about how I wanted my voice to sound because Brad would always bust me on that. I mean, initially I thought that's what I was kind of trying for and then he was like, no, no. Um, so I learned to kind of rely on what I've always relied on, just as in, in terms of acting. Yeah, I feel like, um, there, you know, um, we keep, people who work in animation, we want to be taken seriously, you know. Um, we want to be, you know, not seated at the kids' table all the time, which is what you are. And uh, whether people mean to or not, they always come up to you and lead with, my daughter or son loves your stuff. And I go, well, what do you think about it? And they go, uh, me? Oh, I like it. 
And it's like, lead with that. <laughs> you know, I'm happy that your son is, but lead with that. And so, uh, uh, but at the same time, um, I feel like a lot of animation soundtracks, you can tell without seeing the picture that it's animation because it's, well, listen, Kim, you know? <laughs> you know, and it's like, we don't have to do that. We can be a little more together than that, you know? <laughs> and, and I always responded to voices that sounded natural. And one of the things about the, the old Disney movies made during Walt's uh, lifetime is that they did have natural sounding voices. Even when the voices were extreme, they sound relaxed and natural. Somebody like Sterling Holloway, who did everything from Winnie the Pooh to the Cheshire Cat, um, had a very specific voice that was not like anybody else's, but it sounded natural. It didn't sound like he was doing it. And you may um, do a voice that still sounds natural that's not your natural voice. And um, so uh, anyway, I, I think that uh, uh, the difference for me between live action and animation is uh, live action is um, you can have spontaneity. And in animation, you can study spontaneity and try to figure out how it looks and then get it in there. Um, I think in both mediums, you're trying to capture lightning in a bottle. The difference is in animation, you're capturing it one volt at a time. All right, I think we can squeeze in just one more before watching Incredibles 2. So, yes, okay. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Joanne Bradley. Hi. Question is about Brad's writing process and where he starts. He starts with the whole world or the characters or what? You know, I'd love to tell you that I do it the same way each time, but that's not the way they happen. Um, sometimes I, I have a character that I it just, just hits me. Like on Incredibles, it started out with an over-the-hill superhero. And once I knew that I had him, I started asking questions about him and then answering it the best I could and being surprised sometimes by the answers. And you just keep asking more questions. But sometimes you come up with an ending that you like and you go, who's going to be in this ending? Because I really like this ending. And then you do that and uh, it just goes, it's, it's as individual as a snowflake. There was a film that I still want to make called Ray Gunn that happened when I was listening to uh, a B-52 song called Planet Claire. And it, it uh, yeah, you know the song. So the song goes, starts out going. So I thought, this is the, the theme song to Peter Gunn, which is a 1950s TV show that has one of the greatest theme songs ever. You know that? Peter Gunn. So I'm going, oh, Peter Gunn. And I've never heard this version of it before. And then it goes. And I go, that's not Peter, that's not Peter Gunn. What is that? And I went, that's Ray Gunn. And then I went, Ray Gunn. His name is Raymond Gunn. And he's, it's a science fiction film about a, a detective, you know. And I went, well, who is that? What's his universe? Da 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 da. So that film, that film idea came from a misunderstanding of a song. So <laughs> each one kind of defines its best way to be made. Well, uh, I'm sure I speak for everyone in a second. Listen to the two of you all night, but we have another great movie watch, Incredibles 2. All right. So Woo! thank you so much. Woo! 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 Woo!